if I was acting. So when I was growing up, I never acted until later, but when I was a kid, I realized the most of the acting I had to do was in a situation I'd call the boyfriend bomb. The boyfriend bomb. Boyfriend bomb, the BFB, I call it. Guys in the audience, I think, will know. I don't know if you've had this experience. It's when you're talking to a girl and you're hitting it off. She's cute. You have some chemistry. And then in the conversation, she drops the boyfriend bomb on you. She just sneaks in that she has a boyfriend. She right. drops it right on you. Right in that moment, that's when you have to act. That's really hard, like, real-life acting. Because you can't show your real feelings when it happens, right? So right. if I'm talking to a girl and I'm like, I'm from New Jersey. She's like, oh, my boyfriend's from New Jersey. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's what you don't do. That's the best. I'm sorry, that's the bad example. That's the Don't bad example, do that. right. Okay. That's, that's showing your real feelings. Yes. You feel that, that ruins it, right? It doesn't right. really work. So what do you do? I mean, uh, show me an example. Like, okay, so the mistake I'd make is, and I think this is a beginner's mistake, is you overact to try to overcompensate for the disappointment, try to look not disappointed, but you go too far. So it's like, I'm from New Jersey. Oh, my boyfriend's from New Jersey. What? You have a boyfriend? And he's from New Jersey? Yes! I was wondering, does she have a boyfriend or not? She does, and he's from New Jersey. I got a new best friend. Give me his name, number, email. I want to hang with this guy. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> not good. That's worse. Now she's like, Whoa, what? That's weird. That's yeah. weird. So what you got to do is you got to be neutral. You got to somehow act the way you did before the boyfriend bomb was dropped on your ass. So here's how you do it. I'm from New Jersey. Oh, my boyfriend's from New Jersey. Huh? <laughs> That's cool. I think it's, it's, it's a brilliant... Thank you. Thank you, please. Thank you, audience. And um, thank you to anybody at home who is clapping also. So I'm Dimitri, and um, these are some of my jokes. Let me just wait. Yeah, that sounds funny. Okay. <laughs> I went to the beach yesterday. There are all these people lying out getting suntans. I like suntans. But I'm more into sunburns. Because the sunburn tells a story. Like, hey, that guy likes V-necks. I think it'd be cool if you were writing a ransom note in Microsoft Word if the paperclip popped up and said, it looks like you're writing a ransom note. You need some help? I don't own a poncho. Somebody asked me, do you have a poncho? I don't say no. I say, not right now. Because I have a blanket and scissors. Any minute, I am four minutes from a poncho. I won a medal for that joke. Once. I heard this guy say to his friend, man, I need some R&R. &R. I was like, this guy's tired. He doesn't even have the energy to say, est in elaxation. Dude, I gotta get two R's, I'll explain later. See what's happening is the tamarine's moving away from me and it's harder to hit it. So I'm gonna now move it, but try to do it in time. Yeah, that works. <laughs> that was not metal worthy, that was bad. I like that when someone's good at singing, dancing, and acting, they're called a triple threat. Are you threatening to entertain me? It's not a triple promise, this is a threat. Is she a good dancer? Well, I felt threatened. <laughs> I think they named oranges before they named carrots. <laughs> what a
what it is. Uh, oh, wait. I'm going to make believe nobody clapped. This is how I would say it if nobody clapped. What are these? Uh, those are orange. So oranges, OK. What about these? Oh, crap. Long pointies? We'll go by shape now? I noticed that there are a lot of homeless sign makers. I guess that industry was hit hard recently. I don't like graffiti, unless it teaches me something. Oh, that's how Alex feels about Maria. <laughs> I wouldn't have known that. Graffiti is the most passionate literature there is. It's always like, you two rules. Bush sucks. I want to make indifferent graffiti. Toy Story 2 is okay. <laughs> this is a bridge. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. When I was a kid, I'd sit in class in school and I had trouble paying attention. My mind would wander and I needed something to entertain myself, something to bring into class, to amuse myself, you know? Sneak in my own reading. But it was never anything cool, like uh, muscle flex. <laughs> or sophisticated, like jugs. No. <laughs> you know what I snuck into class? Puzzle books. Like this. Mensa presents Mighty Mind Busters. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm sneaking in. I'm hiding this behind my notebook. While other kids are daydreaming about pecs and tits, in my head there was a very different sound. If a crab and a half weigh a pound and a half, but the half crab weighs as much again as the whole crab, what do half the whole crab and the whole of the half crab weigh? Yeah, baby. <laughs> it hurts so good. I had a pile of these books, obnoxious titles, games for the super intelligent, brain workout, brain workout four. <laughs> I can't even remember all the titles. I think one of them was, I'm smart, how can I prove it? <laughs> Five. <laughs> and I would toil over these problems. When I got one right, I would be like, yes, I am smart. These other idiots don't know how much the crabs weigh. <laughs> but I do. Because I just spent Saturday working it out. <laughs> I matter. See, that was a way to feel validated. As a kid, you have definite problems in front of you with definite answers in the back. You look it up, banana. Yeah, I'm right, definitely, cool. <laughs> I'm better than I was this morning. I progress. Besides, I had a plan. 11 years old, I figured it out. Career, corporate lawyer, done, check, what's for lunch? I just knew where I was headed. Class, yeah, whatever, teacher. I got my little puzzles. I'm going to do my own thing. A cowboy of academics on the edge. Besides, look, other things may have contributed. I wasn't athletic. I was on the church basketball team. But that was because I was Greek and had legs. <laughs> and ladies, the chicks didn't get what I was about, despite my performance on the math team. <laughs> ladies, that's cool squared. <laughs> Sounds even worse now. Whatever the reason, I spent a lot of time as a kid doing these puzzle books. And it came to shape the way I see the world. So now as an adult, I see the world in those terms. For example, to me, a phone number is always a sentence or an equation. Like my friend Becky. Her number is 971-1181, which is 9 minus 7 quantity times 1 equals 11 minus quantity 8 plus 1. If we do a little work, we see her number is just 2 equals 2. That's much simpler. <laughs> or my friend Michael. If you look at the numbers on a telephone, the letters that go with them make this sentence out of his number. O or OK, O, ZK? What does it mean? I don't know. He doesn't know, but that's how we start every conversation. 
even when I walk down the street, things look a little different. The signs, the letters dance around. It's like it becomes a little puzzle for me. So say mobile, the gas station, becomes limbo. Starbucks becomes racks bust. Car phone warehouse. Ah, one sour crap. We. <laughs> When I meet somebody, if I meet you for the first time, you tell me your name, I spell it, immediately it's spelled in the air. And then I try to rearrange the letters, see if I can get something out of it. Say I meet a girl. Denise Houston, good to meet you. Dimitri. Denise, how do you spell your name? That's what I thought. Denise, are you aware that the letters in your name also spell, she not snod, ow. <laughs> not the coolest way to meet a lady, which unfortunately usually makes Dimitri Martin mired trite man. And I get frustrated. And I just want to say, darn it, merit me. <laughs> it's cool, though. I know that someday I'll meet the right lady. I'll rearrange the letters in her name. And it will make Trim TNA ride me. <laughs> but I digress. I just feel like there's a parallel world right in front of us that's revealed with a small shift in perspective. Like sometimes when I look at a donut, it looks like a zero. It's like it's saying, this is how many of me you should eat. But then other times I see a bunch of donuts in a row, and it looks like it says, ooh, <laughs> eat all of us. Then I do, and there's one left, and it says, oh. <laughs> Not cool, fatty. I don't own a poncho. I don't have a poncho. But if somebody says to me, do you have a poncho? I don't say no. I say, Not right now. Because I do have a blanket and scissors. At any moment, I am four minutes from a poncho. <laughs> if you wait here, I will be back with a serape made out of a comforter in four minutes. Even this bottle of beer, this simple object, when I look at this, what I see are words printed all over it. In the design, and the warning on the side, and the message on the back. And I start to wonder, is there more meaning on this simple object than appears at first glance? What if somebody took every word off this bottle and rearranged them? Could it reveal more meaning about beer and bars, people who drink beer a lot? That's what I did. I took every word off this. It's the first poem in your program tonight. It's every word off of this bottle in a different order. If you haven't read it, you don't have to read it now. Read it after the show and think of me in a bar, <laughs> alone, uncomfortable, insecure, completely lost in my mind. Which raises the question, why? Why would a guy sit down with a napkin and a pen, a bottle of beer, and write rolling, rolling, enjoyment, taste, beer? The answer lies in the second meaning of the word if. If, meaning, although, possibly, even though. Okay? Sample sentence. She was an enchanting, if toothless woman. <laughs> show at the Edinburgh Fringe, the best show at the Melbourne Comedy Festival, and here he is in Montreal, it's Dimitri Martin. My name is Dimitri, and uh, these are some of my jokes. I just got some new pajamas with pockets in them. Which is great because before that, I used to have to hold stuff when I slept. My computer beat me at chess, but then I beat him at kickboxing. I think batteries are the most dramatic object of all the objects. Because other things, they stop working, or they break. But batteries, they die. Why aren't you using your Walkman? I can't. My batteries died in my lap this morning. The twins are gone. If you're a battery, you're either working or you're dead. That's a shit life. If I ever saw an amputee being hanged, I would just yell out letters. I want to make a jigsaw puzzle that's 40,000 pieces. And when you finish it, it says, go outside. I went into this clothing store and the lady working there, she got mad at me. She said, what size are you? I said, actual. a trick baby she was amazing 
I never met a woman like this before. She showed me to the dressing room and she said, if you need anything, I'm Jill. I thought, oh my God, I never met a woman before with a conditional identity. What if I don't need anything? Who are you? If you don't need anything, I'm Kevin. Crap. <laughs> That's not good. I like to use glitter. I do crafts a little bit, and I, I work with glitter. But don't worry, I make tough stuff like daggers and skulls. The thing about glitter is, if you get it on you, be prepared to have it on you forever. Because glitter doesn't go away. Glitter is the herpes of craft supplies. It's weird the way finger puppet sounds okay as a noun. Thank you, everybody. Do you have a poncho? I don't say no, I say not right now. Because I do have a blanket and scissors. <laughs> At any moment, I am four minutes from a poncho. <laughs> if you wait here, I will be back with a serape made out of a comforter in four minutes. Even this bottle of beer, this simple object, when I look at this, what I see are words printed all over it. In the design, and the warning on the side, and the message on the back. And I start to wonder, is there more meaning on this simple object than appears at first glance? What if somebody took every word off this bottle and rearranged them? Could it reveal more meaning about beer and bars, people who drink beer a lot? That's what I did. I took every word off this. It's the first poem in your program tonight. It's every word off of this bottle in a different order. If you haven't read it, you don't have to read it now. Read it after the show and think of me in a bar, <laughs> alone, uncomfortable, insecure, completely lost in my mind. Which raises the question, why? Why would a guy sit down with a napkin and a pen, a bottle of beer, and write rolling, rolling, enjoyment, taste, beer. The answer lies in the second meaning of the word if. If meaning although possibly, even though. Okay, sample sentence. She was an enchanting, if toothless woman. <laughs> or in my case, I spend a lot of time doing time consuming, if completely unproductive things. By the time I got to college, I wasn't doing puzzle books anymore. I was becoming a man, an adult. I had evolved. No more puzzle books. Now I was making the puzzles. I went to the school paper and I said, hey, I want to do a crossword puzzle for you guys, but I feel like I've seen the flat thing done before. I wanted more of a challenge. What about a three-dimensional crossword puzzle? Like this. <laughs> you see, this goes across, down, and back. That's three ways to say, I'm lonely. <laughs> I made five of these when I was in college. I spent more time on these puzzles than any class. There is no use for these puzzles. I don't even know if there was a use when I made them. And then when I was in class, I still had trouble paying attention. Same problem as grade school. But now, I found a sick way to up the ante. I found a way to give myself puzzles to solve by the end of class. Like this one, it's nine variable substitution. You see, I am not a dork. If I can find a number for every letter so that this mathematically works, by the end of class, I win. <laughs> and here's the solution. <laughs> A equals 5, M equals 2, K equals... And sometimes a simultaneous equation becomes true with the same numbers. I am not a dork, I am a nerd. <laughs> I wanted to improve my vocabulary. Look, I was in college, I thought, yes, improve. Continue to become better. Expand your vocabulary. If you want to do that, Maybe you read some books, hang out with English teachers, become friends with a poet. I said, no, no, no. Let's take out the middleman. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm going to read the dictionary all the way through, starting at the beginning like a book, in the A's. And every time I come to a word I don't know, highlight the word. Then in groups of 10, I put them in this notebook. You see, so I could quiz myself, 10 at a time, walking around. I'm in the I's here. I'm in the 450s, invective, jangle, jape, intromit, walking around quizzing myself. When someone does this, you might call them abecedarian. More likely, you're going to call them asshole. <laughs> but for me, this all sprang from a growing need to feel validated in the way I did from a puzzle book as a kid. It was a way of feeling like, yes, I'm getting better. I'm succeeding in small increments. But now, it moved off the page of the puzzle book and into the world at large, just little challenges. That's what it became, daily challenges, not big ones. I'm not the guy who climbs Mount Everest, you know? No, thank you. 
I'm the guy who spent two months last year learning how to write with his left hand, forcing himself to write with his left hand. So then I'm in a situation, I'm like, yeah, cool. You haven't broken your right hand, but you know what? It's good to have it. Yeah, write both ways. <laughs> I end up at the bank, say, there's a cute teller, filling out my deposit slip. We flirt a little bit, slide it under the glass, and she's like, this guy's retarded. <laughs> But I'm thinking, ambidextrous genius. Yes, you'll have it. <laughs> if I'm on the street and someone stops me for directions, I give them directions. But I try to do it without using my hands. Because it's hard. It's a challenge. Where's the mall? Then I look sneaky. It's over there. Just go. I don't do this one so much anymore, but there was a time where if I had to pee, if I had to go to the bathroom, I would hold it in. I'd say, okay, it's a systemic challenge. Your body's telling you, urinate. And I'm saying, no, mind over body. I don't have to pee, I'm gonna hold it in. One time I failed that challenge. <laughs> the challenge then became, how do I explain to my boss the wet spot in the front of my pants without giving myself away? And I think I pulled it off, because I went, man, these are some sweaty balls. <laughs> When you do this over time, daily self-imposed hurdles, every day, you develop what I call a number of useless talents. <laughs> useless talents. Useless talents. <laughs> useless. Cycle. When did I become that guy? <laughs> College, sophomore year, second semester, when I joined the Anti-Gravity Society. <laughs> you don't want to be the unicycle guy, trust me. I did my show in New York, my first run. I'd bring my unicycle to the theater every night. And this is how people on the train would look at me. <laughs> but in college, I'm riding around campus thinking, I'm the only guy on a unicycle. When I should have been thinking, I'm the only guy on a unicycle. <laughs> but I thought, yes, you're different, you're special. Yes, you've bruised your balls a few times, but you're different. <laughs> now I'm older, look, I'm, I'm a little wiser. I'm still obsessed with challenges, I can't change that. But they're more creative. Painting, music, sewing. <laughs> I made these for the show, and I think the ass is crooked, am I right? It's okay. <laughs> 